one way that I think is wrong to do relationships is when you never examine them, when you never examine your beliefs about it. And so that's, that's my only thing is just like be courageous enough to, to question and examine what's going on and, and allow things to change. Welcome to Normalizing Non-Monogamy, the podcast where we interview incredible people from across the entire spectrum of non-monogamy to hear their fascinating stories. We strive to bring guests on the show who have a healthy approach to non-monogamy. However, it's important to remember that everyone does it a little bit differently, and the views and opinions expressed by our guests do not necessarily reflect our own. Additionally, we produce this show for entertainment purposes only. Please be aware that we aren't doctors or therapists. Consult a medical professional for anything regarding your health that you might learn about on the show. Enjoy. Welcome to episode 99, one away from 100. We're super excited. Did you know 99 is a palindrome? I did know that. You said that pretty much every palindrome episode we've had. And I will continue (laughs) to do so. Well, then we'll have another one soon. At 101. Uh Uh-huh. Okay. So today we have an interview with Jace. Who's Jace? I'm going to just read from Jace's profile on the multiamory.com website. Before I do that, though, maybe I should explain what multiamory is. Jace is one of the three co-hosts of the Multiamory podcast, which is a a podcast about... (laughs) About relationships and sex positivity and all things awesome. And they've been doing it for for about five years, which is amazing. And it's three co-hosts. There's Dedeker, Emily, and Jace. Yep. And we've got Jace today. We've got Dedeker in a couple of weeks. And maybe someday we'll even get to talk to Emily. Yeah. Anyway, back to Jace. Jace is a non-monogamous dating coach, healthy masculinity educator, and sex positivity advocate. He is trained in positive psychology, emotional freedom technique, consent education, and Buddhist mindfulness practice. He has worked with the government and celebrities on HIV public awareness in Russia, is a longtime fan of podcasts, and is excited to share this new and unique content with the world. By teaching people how to suck less at communication and define each relationship on its own terms, Jace is sought out as an authority on modern dating. That was a mouthful. But also T- really T- impressive. TLDR, he knows his shit. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, today is not him preaching at us by any means. It's basically his story and a lot of amazing wisdom. So we hope you enjoy it as much as we enjoyed talking to him. Yes. couple quick announcements as usual. Our next Patreon Q&A call is December 15th at 9 p.m. Eastern and 9 p.m. Pacific. That is a Sunday. Uh, we're excited. So that's to- two calls. It is two calls. We're excited to talk to everyone. Then go to our website and click on the Patreon banner if you want to learn more about joining. And you should want to join and just come be part of the awesome community we're building. The last one we did, we had 15 on the earlier call and we had like six people on the later call. And it was like, it was just awesome community building. So we're having a lot of fun with it. It's one of our favorite things to do. Also, our website has an events page, and on that events page, there's an email list. Now, currently, we do not have any upcoming events. However, in early 2020, we plan to get moving on that, and we'll have more events posted. So if you want to be some of the first people to find out about that, go and sign up for our email list on our events page. At normalizingnonmonogamy.com. Yes. And while you're there, you'll also see a resources page and probably pictures of almost all of our guests, including today's. Yep. And you can also contact us on our website. You can leave us a voicemail or send us an email. We'd love to hear from you. And if you want to come on the show, we'd love to also hear from you. Please reach out. Yeah. Everybody's story is important and awesome to hear and share. So, And this show does not work unless people reach out to us. Okay. What else? What else? Well, real quick, we'll just mention that if you want to save $10 off of your online STD testing through STD Check, use the links on our website, either on the resources page or right on the home page. It's an awesome service. We use it every six months, like clockwork, to get our testing done. Yep. It's affordable. It's super damn easy. It's fast. And we can't recommend it enough. So check that out. Help support the show and help support safer testing practices in the non-monogamous community. Yeah. 
Now, can we go talk to Jace? Come on, come on, come on. <laughs> Let's go. Well, welcome, welcome, Jace, coming around all the way around the world. This is like we've done a couple of these lately. We had yeah. Australia, and now we're in Japan. So it's exciting nice. to have you on. Yeah, I know. I think we're almost exactly on opposite sides of the world. We're like 11 hours apart right it's, now. I, That's I about so. as close as you can get, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, well, good good morning, I suppose. Um, yeah, it is. It's 10 a.m. right now. There you go. <laughs> yeah, we're getting ready for bed after this, probably. So. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's not true. We're doing an interview with Dedeker. Yeah, after that's this. true. <laughs> I know, right? You, you guys scheduled us on the same day, and we realized that yesterday, and we're like, oh, man, it's going to be like, you know, the newlywed game or something where you're right. going to ask us questions about each other and we're going to get them wrong or something like that. Well, and that wasn't intentional. It was just the way it worked out. <laughs> so, well, there will be a test at the end. Um, <laughs> Perfect. Well, for, for anybody who doesn't know who Jace is or maybe what, what multi-amory is, do you mind maybe just doing a quick overview yeah. of, of your show and, and a little background on yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I'm Jace, and I'm one of three hosts of the Multi Amory podcast, and we've been going for about five years now, uh, doing a podcast about... It, it actually originally started as a show specifically about polyamory, and since then, in those intervening five years, has kind of broadened a little bit to be not even not just about polyamory, but also not just about non-monogamy. It's really kind of about relationships in general for people who want kind of uh, advice and tools and research and information about doing relationships in a way that isn't isn't the advice you're going to get on Dr. Phil, yeah, right? Yeah. It's not kind of the super mainstream Cosmo level relationship right. advice. <laughs> so, right. A little bit so, deeper, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. A little bit deeper. And, and I guess even for people in monogamous relationships, people who aren't afraid to kind of step outside the box of what that's supposed to look like. And I yeah. sure. put supposed yeah. to in quotes. Yeah, yeah. no, it's for sure. You're being, being able to pull on your, your backgrounds and expertise, so to speak, in non-monogamy gives you a different framework for approaching problems in monogamous relationships too. I think that's... Uh, absolutely. Yeah. And we've got, we've had a lot of people write reviews or things like that saying I'm monogamous, but I have really found a lot of value from your show and it's helped me work through some things like jealousy or possessiveness or codependency or things like that. So right on. that's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. It's been great. And on a, on a personal level, maybe some background on who, who you are. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, yeah, I don't even know where to, where to start. I was, <laughs> I was born in a small town. No, uh, <laughs> gosh, where do I start? Um, I it, have done a lot of different things in my life and, uh, have, and also travel quite a bit. I'm sure Dedeker will talk about that a, a fair amount too, when you talk to her. Um, but currently I am doing the podcast. I'm also creating a podcast production company for helping produce other people's podcasts. Uh, in addition to multi Amory, I'm also the, the same three hosts. Actually, we do, uh, another show called drunk Bible study, which is totally, totally different kind of a thing. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's basically what it sounds like. We, we drink and we read the Bible and try to make sense of it as three people who are not advocating for or against Christianity or more just kind of like, what's this book all about? And so that's, that's been a lot of fun. We've been doing that a little over a year now. <laughs> yeah. I bet that's hilarious. A lot of <laughs> just the discussions I imagine that you get into. <laughs> right. Totally. And the sort of drinking games we come up with along right. the way. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah. So what else about myself? Um, I, in addition to kind of doing the like technical stuff of podcast producing and things like that, my kind of role in multi-amory and in my own work tends to focus around uh, masculinity and kind of talking about what that means rather than from a totally academic standpoint, but kind of talking to mostly to men, you know, people who identify as men about kind of what our relationship to masculinity has been, uh, you know, how can we sort of find the good parts of that while moving away from some of the toxic parts of that and not needing to be super defensive about it, I guess, uh, which right. is the reaction I, I feel like I see a lot out there when people try to talk about masculinity is this kind of like, 
what? You're saying I'm a bad person. It's like, well, no, there's some more nuance than that. Right. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's kind of, uh, my role amongst the three of us is kind of the sort of go-to person for that, I guess. For sure. And how, I guess how long, well, we're assuming you're non-monogamous, but I mean, I am, yes. yeah. <laughs> how, how long have you been exploring that? And I guess maybe, can you take us through like how you got yeah have the... you have you been a non-monogamous since you were a teenager or was like what kind of what's your mindset behind it all right totally yeah so for me uh, i grew up uh in a relatively conservative christian household you know maybe not as super conservative as some but you know was brought up with that i was saving myself for marriage uh you know was pretty into it in in high school i got really back into it um it kind of was not born again by definition, but, you know, kind of really got back into the Christianity thing. And um, after college, actually was considering going to seminary school, uh, ended up going to beauty school and becoming a hairstylist instead. <laughs> so I kind of went a different direction. <laughs> That's a big change. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but so for me, a big turning point for me was actually in college, uh, my senior year of college, when I read the book Stranger in a Strange Land by mm -hmm. Heinlein. Yeah. And for me, it's funny actually, cause going back and reading the book a couple of times since then, uh, it's, it's, it's a problematic book. It was also written in the fifties or sixties or something. Yeah. Uh, so it's pretty outdated in the way it talks about gender and sexuality and, and things like that. But for me at the time, there, there's specifically a part in it where uh, okay, there's no spoilers here, I think, but <laughs> basically the, the premise is that this guy who grew up on Mars, was raised by Martians, comes back to Earth, like he's brought back to Earth. He's the only human who was ever raised on Mars by Martians. So he comes back to Earth with this kind of totally different belief set about how the world works. And he also has superpowers. It's kind of that whole idea of like, if you were never taught that you couldn't hold your breath for 10 minutes or right. fly or something, that maybe you could. Kind of that that sort of fantasy idea. And kind of a religion ends up sort of growing around him. And in part of that, everyone is sort of free to have sex with each other. And he has this romantic relationship with a woman, but she's with other people. And anyway, he's talking with uh, a guy who kind of is one of our main characters. He's talking to him and he's like, hey, I know that you really like her. Why don't you two be together? I know she likes you as well. And he's like, what are you talking about? I thought you loved her. Why would you want me to be with her if you love her? And he kind of goes into this thing of, well, yeah, if, if loving someone means that their happiness is intrinsic to your happiness, why would I want to limit her from doing something that I know would make her happy? Because I know she likes you. It doesn't make sense. He's like, jealousy isn't part of love. It's opposite of love. It's, you know, wanting to control someone else and not give them what makes them happy. And for me, that was that, like, it just hit me at the right time that it was that mind blowing right. kind of moment. Right. And I kind of honestly sort of overnight went from someone who would self-define myself as a jealous person to someone who, who wasn't. And so in that relationship that I was in at the time in my senior year, we started exploring non-monogamy kind of more along the lines of like swingerish type of open relationship, um, you know, occasionally playing with other people, not really having relationships outside of that. Mm -hmm. Uh, but that kind of opened the doorway. And so that would that was in 2005. So what, like 14 years ago? Mm -hmm. But then it was somewhat more recently, maybe six or seven years ago, when I discovered polyamory. And then it was like, oh, okay, here's the next sort of mind-opening idea that not only that, but people can have multiple, you know, invested romantic serious committed relationships and and that everyone involved can be okay with that and to right. me that was also again it was this kind of like oh my god people are doing this thing that there's this part of me that always kind of wished something like that was possible or thought maybe it could be but it was more like oh uh, yeah in my fantasy world where you know everyone has free healthcare and free education. Like then we also can have multiple relationships. Right. <laughs> and then yeah. It's like, Oh no, wait, people are doing this. That's, that's <laughs> why those bills haven't been passed by the way, because of the multiple relationships clause. 
<laughs> right. That's all part of it. Yeah. But so, so in that gap between your senior year and like sort of exploring swinging with a partner to mm-hmm. f- discovering the polyamory piece, did you continue to explore like non-monogamous dynamics? And it was like roughly an eight year sort of window there. Yeah, I guess so. Huh? Jeez. Time flies. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to call you old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So it, it kind of varied because I had a, a number of different relationships during that time that, that one relationship that I had when we were trying that, uh, we were together for, a couple more years after college, um, but eventually kind of went different directions with our life. And, and uh, in the other relationships that I had kind of in the meantime, it really varied. Some that were a little more open-ish, like varying degrees of that. But I would say the vast majority were more monogamous. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that, uh, honestly... The the times looking back now, I don't I don't think I would have said this at the time, but looking back, I feel like the times where I actually kind of got the closest to kind of an understanding of a polyamory type of non-monogamy was during the times when I was single and dating. And for most people, being single and dating, which is a very commonplace thing in in our culture you know it's just oh yeah of course it's normal it's what you do when you're not in a monogamous relationship part of that is about uh, you know keeping it secret from everyone else maybe not like hiding it per se but you're not telling everyone that you're also dating other people there's kind of this right unspoken Unsp- understanding yeah right sure. that that's yeah. that that's just what you do right uh it just and some people even to the extent of you know pretending as if you you haven't even had sex with anyone else you know there's kind of varying degrees that people sort of play that game of of i don't know pretending to be monogamous while dating but uh, in my case i i had this experience where um i was i was dating a woman and i was also like while i was dating her had started dating another woman and one day one of them called me up on the phone and was like so what's the deal? A friend of mine said that he saw you at a cafe with this redheaded girl and what's the deal? And I responded by saying, uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we're just dating. I'm also dating her too. And that's, uh, you know, if, if that's not okay, maybe that's a conversation to have, but that's, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, totally. Right. And her reaction to it was sort of a, oh, Oh, okay. Yeah, that's fine with me. <laughs> uh, like, the the fact that you were honest about it just kind of like totally changed my approach to to finding that information out. And so for me, that was kind of one of those first seeds of like, huh, being honest about this is maybe has better results, or or at least gives people the option to. And um, and neither of those relationships ended up being super long lasting as romantic relationships, but actually I'm still friends with that woman, you know, now, however many years later, I guess, gosh, like 11 years later, uh, you know, we're, we're still friends. And, you know, through that friendship was someone that I could then talk to about, gosh, in my ideal world, I would love to be able to have, you know, to have a romantic relationship but then also to be able to have those feelings for someone else and that my partner would also be able to have those. I've always been pretty motivated by kind of a fairness way of thinking about things Uh, way before this, you know, just in general fairness is an important value to me. And so I think in all of that, that, that part, which I think for some people they struggle with that thing of, and I also want my partner to have this, that that for me right from the beginning was like, no, no, no. If, if I'm going to want something, I have to be okay with my partners having that. Right. Uh, Cause that's just an intrinsic value for me is, is fairness. Yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. And they don't, they don't actually have to have somebody there. It's just that they have the option that you're also. Right. Uh, yeah. Right. 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 That right. I wouldn't want to say I can do something that you can't. Right. Or that, yeah. or that you should put up with something that I don't have to or anything like <laughs> right. that. Right. Or that something yeah. that I think is gross, I want you to do. Like if we're talking about sex, stuff like right. that. Sure. I think that comes up a lot where it's like, ew, but I want my partner to do it. <laughs> okay. Well, let's examine that a little bit because <laughs> there's maybe some problems there. <laughs> yeah. 
it's definitely not fair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and so then, like, and those kind of moments happened. Like, it sounds like in bits and pieces, you were just sort of like, yeah. pieces were falling into place. And I guess, how did you come across, like, that that the word not the word polyamory existed and that that was the thing like that you'd been searching for that you didn't know existed yeah so for me um so again this this would have been you know six or seven years ago or whenever this was i was dating emily who's also one of the co-hosts of the multi-amory podcast uh, and we'd been together <clears throat> monogamously for a few years before that we were living together and we kind of reached this point where you know, things had been, it was like our relationship was good and we loved each other a lot. We got along very well. We made good roommates, you know, all of that. But there was kind of this something that was missing. And eventually we had this conversation where she was essentially saying, I love you a lot and, and I like my relationship with you, but there's sort of a romance spark or something that I want to have in my life that I don't feel like I have. So I think that we should break up. And my response to it at the time was, yeah, I've, I've kind of felt a similar thing. I don't want to break up though. Is there, is there any other option here? And that kind of started a series of many, many conversations <laughs> over a while, but that involved us you know, uh, breaking up for uh, like a week or two. And then, uh, you know, and I went on some other dates on OkCupid during that. And like, I was out on a date and we, we still lived together. We hadn't moved out or anything yet. And I came home from the date and both of us were like, oh my gosh, I'm so into you. And, you know, and, and mm -hmm. <laughs> Emily and I, you know, had sex and we're like, okay, what's going on? Like there's something here. If like, once we didn't have each other, it's like, oh my gosh, no, but actually I do really want this. And so then, so then we said, well, what if we did an open relationship? And that's, cause that's the only touch point we had at that point yeah. was an open relationship. And so, you know, we, we did that and for, for a few months, kind of struggled with it honestly it was tough and during that time heard about the word polyamory and like the ethical slut was recommended as well as sex at dawn those mm -hmm. were sort of the two books that we started with and um i read sex at dawn and she read the ethical slut and we would talk about the two <laughs> books and kind of share what we were reading and it was interesting how very different impressions of polyamory we each got by reading those two different books yeah yeah, it's they're, like they're I would different, read, yeah. Yeah, very different different approach, I guess, or different kind of I think a different sort of direction to think about things. And uh but we really struggled with it actually. Specifically for her, it was just harder for her to get there in terms of I think partly because the just the quality of people she was finding to date was not great. Uh you know that she was going on dates with guys who assume the fact that she's in an open relationship just means she's DTF or it just means that she wants something casual or it just means that she's waiting until she finds someone better or um, or even just outright jumping to calling her names and saying awful things to her. Yeah. You know, these are the kinds of reactions she was getting more than I was. And I had, you know, I had, I had one person who I was dating a little bit through that and had gone on some other dates, but only kind of one really, you know, turned into more than just one or two dates. And then and eventually we ended like, up I was just saying, like, yeah. str really struggling to find people that understood what you were doing, right? Like, yeah. that was the struggle. Yeah, yeah. so, yeah, eventually. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. And so we ended up closing our relationship um, because she was just upset by it, not having a good time with it. And so we're like, I said yeah, let's, let's close it back up. Let's, you know, we'll still talk about this, but I am really happy with you and I don't want to make you miserable just because this is something that I, that I do think I would like. Yeah. And so we ended up closing it again. And then another, maybe six months or so after that, I'm really bad with time, by the way. So no, if I'm off on any of these dates, <laughs> Well, sorry. Emily will probably be the only one to know. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's probably true. Dedeker and Emily constantly make fun yeah. of me for, to me, like everything that happened in the past was the other day. 
<laughs> be like, oh, like, right, we were talking about that the other day, or we just went there the other day, and they were like, Jace, that was three years ago, or you know, something <laughs> like that. To me, everything was the other day. Or it might have been like this morning. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember the other day when we talked about this. They're like, that was just a few hours ago. What are you doing? <laughs> So my sense of time is a little bit uh, loose. No, no, but anyway, <laughs> another uh, number of months after that, um, Emily came to me and said, hey, I've been thinking about this open relationship polyamory thing and kind of want to try that again. And I was like, okay, let's, let's not jump right into that. Let's talk about it. And we kind of had some conversations over the course of maybe a week or so, kind of every day, like let's talk some more about this and really be sure if we're going to do this again, we're going to keep doing it and not just kind of keep doing this open, close, open, close, open, close thing. And in that conversation, part of it was that there was a guy that she'd kind of always had an interest in from college, I think, that is one of those things where it had just never quite worked out mm -hmm. because one or the other would be in a relationship with someone else and they couldn't be together. And anyway, he was single at this time and was going to be coming to San Diego and we were in LA and she's like, and I want to go down and see him and, you know, see what could happen with that. And I was like, okay, but let's, if we're going to do this, let's really do this though. And not just, you know, like I said, keep opening and closing it. And right. so we had that conversation. We're like, yeah, let's do it. And she uh, went down there that, that weekend and, and spent the night there with him and came back and was like, I get it now. She's like, it was great. I had a great time. I really enjoyed myself, but I, but it didn't make me love you less. Like it didn't make me do all those things that I was worrying that you were experiencing of like loving me less or being less into me or less excited to see me again or all those things. She's like, I get it now. I get it. And so then we're like, okay, we're, we're doing this thing. And so from then, from then on, we were polyamorous uh, and using that label was the one that we, you know, right. went with was polyamory. And uh, yeah, we did that and we were together for another couple of years after that and did end up uh, ending our romantic relationship later on, uh, and, but, you know, still remaining close and doing the show together. And actually that's given us a lot of interesting stuff to talk about on the show of kind sure. of how that's possible to do as well, which I think is something that is not exclusive to polyamory and non-monogamy, but I think... I, I think that approaching things from a non-monogamous viewpoint makes that type of transition a little more possible, or at least gives some more tools for doing it than kind of the traditional, very possessive model of monogamy does. Yeah. yeah and when, when the relationship's over, we're no longer speaking or we, we, we right. have to hate, we have to hate each other now. Yeah. And that all of our friends have to hate each other, have to yeah. hate the other person too. Right. They have you know, to pick they, a side. Yeah. yeah. Divide them up. And yeah. 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 No, we definitely both had experiences of that where I had a friend who was like, wait, so we hate Emily now. Right. And I was like, no, 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 no. Like we don't. He's like, but, but you broke up. Like, <laughs> like, but we're, but okay, we don't hate her, but we're mad at her, right? And it's like, well, no, like, sure, we've got some feelings, but you know, we're not. Like, got a baseball no, not... bat, he's heading out to smash yeah, the car. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, and, you know, her family and friends reacted very much like, right, we always hated that guy. You know, here's all the things about him that sucked. And, you know, kind of jumping on that, like, we're going to support our friend through yeah. her breakup by talking shit about the other person. Yeah. yeah. And that, so that, that was difficult. Um, but it's yeah, that's kind of the only way people know how, how to that how to goes. react. Yeah. They, they, like, yeah, they're trying exactly. to be supportive, right? And that's the right. only that's right. the only thing they know how to do. So I'm, yeah, I'm, exactly. I'm curious, like back when you 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 opened it because you felt like there was a spark missing, mm -hmm. and it didn't go well, and the the default you came to was closing the relationship, not ending the relationship. Like what was mm. what was the reason for that? Like, did you find sort of that spark again while you were off, you know, dating other people, even though it wasn't going well necessarily for both of you? Yeah, um, I think. Uh, well, okay, yes, and to to a certain extent, you know, like with that experience when we were, you know, broken up for a week or whatever, and we're like, oh my gosh, now I'm really into you. Like, there was a certain element of things are new, things are fresh, things kind of mm. got revitalized by that 
And, and I feel like that's an experience I've heard echoed by a lot of people who dabble in swinging, where it's maybe something they'll do once a year, but it's like that's enough to kind of Re- reignite something. Shake, yeah. You're right, shake things up. Um, so I think there was an element of that, but honestly, I think it more came from, at least from my side, I, I can't speak for her, but from my side, it was just more of a, I really value this relationship and that this isn't something that I want to just give up so easily. Mm-hmm. You know, that this is, you know, like I, I know what, I know when I have a good thing mm-hmm. and I don't want to just throw that away. Um, and yeah, you know, and, and our relationship was very good. I think even during those times when we were struggling in non-monogamy, we, we never got to that point that I unfortunately do see with a lot of couples that either we work with, as the podcast or that I work with, you know, talking with people individually, uh, of getting kind of, um, toxic and destructive to each other, Mm -hmm. really kind of in, in your hurt, tearing the other person down and trying to hurt them and kind of, um, that kind of contempt that can seep into a relationship that that's not a place we ever went to. And so, so the relationship itself still felt good, you know, that it's still, it right, still had a positive feeling to right. it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I guess part of that, like, I, I imagine a lot of those feelings of like wanting to tear the other person down, even if it's subconsciously, comes from like jealousy or envy, right? Like they're doing something that I'm not, and I wish I was doing it. Or, you know, in in the case when you first started, like you were having really good dates and she wasn't, right. and that's a, that's a really easy thing to be triggering for those feelings of like. Oh, for sure. Yeah. But have yeah. have you you said you kind of like your your jealousy sort of evaporated when you read uh, the book Stranger in a Strange right. Land? Like, has yeah. it has it crept back in at all, or has it was that the cure all? Is that the prescription <laughs> for for jealousy? <laughs> right. Uh, so yeah, so jealousy is you know within polyamory is something that gets talked about a lot, uh, at least. Early on, I think when people are starting in polyamory, that's always the number one question. And, uh, you know, and it was it was for us, it was especially in starting the podcast was not only something that we'd already thought about, but now it was also the thing everyone wanted to know. Yeah. And so we, you know, spent a lot of time, a lot of time thinking about it and learning more about it and all that. And what I would say is that f- basically, I, I think that jealousy is a term that we use for a lot of different feelings and a lot of different thoughts. And we call them all jealousy. And I think that in doing that, it's like something that might help with one thing, like one sort of feeling that we call jealousy might not help with a different thing. And that I might experience another thing that we would also probably colloquially call jealousy that again, might be different than those other things. And I think some are more difficult than others and some are harder for certain people. But for me, reading Stranger in a Strange Land, the type of jealousy specifically that that one changed for me was the possessiveness, Mm -hmm. like the possessiveness kind of jealousy, which is that if I love someone, it means they can only be with me and I can only be with them and that, that I have to kind of have a level of control or yeah. a level of kind of obedience uh, is maybe another way that that can be or, thought of. Or that you have to be the source of their happiness, right? Like, Yeah, the only source of their happiness. Exactly. You know, right. For a lot of people, that possessiveness extends not just to them not dating other people, but even their friendships, you yes. know, that, that even those are going to become lesser, be- become less important to them. Uh, because I should fill all of that for you. And similarly, you need to be all of that for me, right? Yeah. Like yeah. now you need to not only be the person I have sex with and that I go on romantic dates with, but also need to be the person I dump on when I'm feeling bad and I've had a bad day at work. And you also need to be the person who holds me accountable for my diet that I said I'm going to do. And you're also the person who needs to help me remember my relative's birthdays. And, you, you know, it's like we take kind of all these roles that through our lives might have been spread out between different friends or family members or other people. And then we say, now you have to do all of these. Yes. And I, so for me, it really shook up that whole idea of the, that possessiveness. Mm -hmm. Uh, So then to answer your question about still feeling jealousy after that, sure. But I think it didn't 
for me at least didn't come from that place of possessiveness yeah anymore or at least not as much or or if it did come up i was able to to see that and go oh okay this is this is that thing though that's that's we're taught as love but it isn't mm -hmm. so i'm not going to i'm not going to go with that right i'm going to yeah. change my thinking about it because well, it could be like a fear of missing out or a sadness over something or like like you mm -hmm. said there's many different emotions that are we call jealousy yeah. that may not right. are different yeah yeah totally and then also i this was something that uh oh gosh i think it was gabby dunn who said this but i but i don't remember it was in a youtube video about you know questions for polyamorous people uh and the analogy that she gave that i thought was really great was you know, as mature adults, we feel jealousy all the time. We feel jealousy of our siblings growing up or of our friends who get a promotion when we didn't or our friend who just started a new relationship while we're going through a breakup, a coworker who got a promotion we didn't. What Like we deal with jealousy all the time in terms of that, like, oh, but I, that person has something that I wanted or maybe mm -hmm. that fear of missing out or whatever it is. We We experience it all the time, but as adults in society, we learn productive, healthy, non-destructive ways to deal with that. And that's normal. Yeah. But as soon as you put that in the context of a romantic or sexual relationship, it's like that all goes out the window. And if you kill someone over your romantic jealousy, that's totally understandable. Yeah, and we're that like, was their fault. But what the fuck like, you know in our in our normal society like we would never use that justification for any other type of jealousy why is this one yeah treated so differently so i yeah. think that you know absolutely i felt jealousy about all sorts of things but yeah, it's for sure it's like yeah as a mature human i'm gonna find ways to to deal with that that doesn't involve flying off the handle and just you know, yeah. losing my cool about it. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Being, um, handling it in a mature and, uh, oh, I guess less destructive way, maybe. Yeah. 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 And it yeah. takes practice, right? I mean, just like anything. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. For yeah. sure. So, and I think that's something too, that's important is like, you don't always nail it on the first try and, and oh, for sure. Yeah. You're, you're, you're constantly course correcting on that. So it's awesome. Yeah. 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 Have, have, has your your approach to polyamory has that evolved and changed since they were like how you go about it and what because then like having done this ourselves for a, a number of years like we know the you know the non-hierarchical the all the different and relationship anarchy and there's people have tons of different terms i guess have, right have you evolved through the the web of different labels of any kind <laughs> absolutely yeah or non-labels yeah. yeah or non-labels <laughs> right yeah when uh when emily and i first opened up our relationship well we, you know at first we used open relationship but once we started using polyamory i think partly because the ethical slut was one of our kind of starting points for that we thought very much in terms of this is our primary relationship everything else is secondary and very much about uh that that for us, what being primary meant is that like no one can be more important than you. And we didn't, we didn't do some of I, what I think are the very problematic things that, that people who really kind of want to defend a hierarchy of their existing relationship do things like veto or things like very restrictive rules about what you can and can't do with other people versus what you can do with me kind of more controlling we, right yeah that are more more controlling uh that we didn't go down that route luckily because uh, i think that would have been a harder thing to get out of at least that's been my experience uh you know seeing that happen with other people but there was very much this like uh, for both of us like i need to be reassured that i'm the most important and that that's going to stay that way yeah. uh which, when I think about it, is very similar to in monogamous relationships. For a lot of people, myself included, you know, we we wanted this. Uh, I want reassurance that you're always going to love me, right? That right. you're always going to be together. We even do it in our marriage ceremonies, right? We promise that we're always going to do this thing. And just being a total pragmatist, I'm like, yeah, but he, we can't know that as humans. Right. You know, I, I don't know how I'm going to feel an hour from now. I could make some educated guesses 
about how I'm going to feel an hour from now, but I can't 100% say that. And then when you extrapolate that out to years from now, I just don't think anyone can promise that, um, can, can make a promise about how they'll feel. Maybe you can make a promise about what you'll do and yeah, then, you'll you know, act. put the, yeah. put the effort into what you'll do with that. But I think making promises about how we'll feel as normal as that is, is actually not something that we, I guess, have the authority to make promises about. <laughs> yeah. That, it's so that variable. Any sense. It changes and yeah. people grow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but so, so we started from there and then over time ended up kind of moving away from liking those labels of, of primary and secondary. And that was something that kind of, as the podcast, you know, as we're learning more from other people and kind of staying on top of what's currently being talked about in the world of polyamory, we kind of started moving away from moving away, not only from hierarchy, but also moving away from rules in general. Uh, and instead kind of approaching the relationships from I'm in a relationship with someone because, or, you know, and part of that is believing that they're going to treat me well. And so if they know what things are harder for me and what things make me happy and, you know, whatever, that they're going to do those things, not because there's a rule saying they have to, mm -hmm. but because they love me and they want to. Yeah. And if they don't, like if, if I truly believed my partner would not have my best interests at heart, if I didn't have rules to make them do it, then that's maybe a, a, a different problem to address by not being in that relationship. So, you know, kind of moved more toward that. And then later on, uh, learned about relationship anarchy and that the part of that specifically that really changed things in my mindset was kind of recognizing the fact that as people in our society, we're kind of, we've inherited this, this hierarchy of relationships in a different way than the primary secondary thing, but this hierarchy in that a romantic relationship is always more important than any other type of relationship with the exception of maybe parents and children. But that besides that, a romantic relationship kind of trumps everything by default, right? Like that experience of someone gets into a new romantic relationship and suddenly you as their friend don't see them for the next six months to a year or whatever, because of course they're going to do that. Right. If they get an extra ticket to something or an extra invite to something, their plus one will always be the romantic partner and not another friend. Or even just if you have a romantic partner and you're invited to something, you just assume that they're invited too. Whereas if I was yeah. going to bring a friend, I'd probably check and be like, hey, is it okay if I bring my friend? But if it's my romantic partner, it's just like, yeah, of course. You invited me. You have to, Obviously, you've invited them too because we're, we're socially yeah. the top type of hierarchical unit that there can be. And uh, sort of realizing that and kind of going, oh, gosh, yeah, you're right. Like not only realizing that we do that, but then also seeing that there's a lot of value that I could be, that I am getting from my friendship relationships or from even my more casual sexual relationships that, you know, people that I'm friends with who we also have sex sometimes or people who I'm romantic with where we don't have sex or, you know, just my platonic friends and my romantic partners and my family. And that there's a lot of value that I get from all of those that I was kind of taking for granted. And for me, that really changed how I thought about my friendships and things and actually led to me dating a lot less because I realized actually some of maybe the the needs that I was trying to get filled by dating and finding new romantic partners, maybe I was actually getting some of those met already. And I right. just wasn't receiving that. Uh, yeah. And so it actually led to me dating a lot less, which has been great. Uh, it's led to just <laughs> sort of a lot more time for my emotional and physical well-being and my, you know, getting good work done and launching a production company and working uh -huh. on multi-amory and, you know, all of this stuff became more possible and also allowed me to kind of set a higher standard for myself for what types of dating I do want to do. Mm -hmm. right. um, and I don't mean higher in just sort of an objectively better, but more of a higher standard of like, what does this mean for me? Is this right. really yeah. w what I want? And not just, I've got free time, I've got to fill it because I'm lonely. You yeah. know, that, so yeah, that was sure. a big change for me was kind of um, 
opening up those ideas through relationship anarchy of kind of mm -hmm. yeah. getting getting to that idea of like I could be very committed to a friendship and that that can also be just as valid and just as important as a romantic relationship. Yeah. 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 For sure. I was I was wondering real quick if you just do you mind sort of defining briefly what what relationship anarchy like is to you? I know you kind of like explained what it right. what it looks like but like what what it typically is in in the realm of non-monogamy right uh yeah basically the way that the way that i would define it and i try to base this as much as possible off of the relationship anarchy manifesto which is sort of what what kind of started the whole thing uh and that that's a, a fairly short thing i think it's like 10 paragraphs uh written by uh, someone named andy nordgren uh, and it's, uh, let me see, well, let me look it up here. I'm going to give you, <laughs> give you some more information about it. Uh, but what's really cool about it is that it's just very succinct and very beautiful. And it grew out of this community. You know, this isn't something that Andy came up with by themselves. This is something that, you know, was discussed within their community of queer and gender nonconforming people from a place of the typical sort of social hierarchy of relationships doesn't mm -hmm. work for us because maybe, maybe our families aren't our families anymore because they've kind of disowned us because of this or our relationships are not valued by society. And so we don't get that same sort of automatic preferential treatment for our romantic relationships. And so they kind of put together this, this thing of, uh, yeah, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine paragraphs. That's all it is. So anyway, I try to base my, de my definition as much off of that as possible. There are other people who have kind of different definitions of relationship anarchy, some of which I think are kind of problematic, where this comes from a place of like, let's find love and community and ways to support each other. And I think others have taken it maybe to a place of I don't need to have any responsibilities to anyone. I was going to say, I or, can do whatever I want. And it's, right. It's, yeah. yeah, that it means I can be irresponsible and justify it by putting this label on it. Right. Yeah, uh, yeah, for sure. Or people who go, oh, relationship anarchy, that means I want to tear down monogamy. Uh, right. And it's not that, like, that's not, none of that is what actually, what this started as. You know, that's all just shit that other people have tried to do with it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Awesome. But uh, the sort of the metaphor that I like to use for it that is not something from the it's the short instructional manifesto for relationship anarchy is the name of it. <laughs> uh, that this is not from there. Um, this kind of comes from some other sources. Like uh, Carrie Jenkins has a great book called "What Love Is and What It Could Be," mm -hmm. uh, and then also some things that we talk about a lot on the podcast. And it's basically that. What what we've all done normally in our relationships is like buying set menus at a restaurant, right? It's like all you can get is the combo meals. Yes. And what that means is if I want to have a friendship, that means, okay, a friendship means I'm definitely going to get someone who uh, maybe is okay with me not calling them every day. And they're someone who I can be maybe a little more blunt with or a little straightforward with, uh, but I definitely can't have sex with them. Uh, and you know, maybe we could live together as roommates, but if I have a romantic partner, I should probably live with them instead, you know, kind of comes with this whole set of mm -hmm. things and then, oh, I want to have a romantic partner. So that set combo meal comes with, uh, you know, that we could live together, that we do get to have sex. Cool. Uh, and that maybe an expectation that we would have kids together or get married or various things. Right. And then there's all sorts of other you know, people come up with other terms like friends with benefits, but even that kind of is its own set yeah. thing of like, well, calling someone friends with benefits means, okay, I get to have sex with them. They're a friend, but like, maybe it also means I don't think this is going to last as long, or maybe this means it's because I'm kind of auditioning them to be a romantic relationship. You know, it, the sets might be a little different for each person, mm -hmm. but they still just come in these sets. And that relationship anarchy is saying, actually, no, there's no sets. You can't get any sets. You just have to choose everything that you want in your right. in that package, right? And so you could say, I want to have someone who I live with, 
and I raise children with, but we don't have a sexual relationship. Maybe we don't have a romantic relationship either, that it is more of what we would call just a friendship relationship. Um, and, you know, but this is someone that I trust and that I know is going to raise good children. And so I want to do that with them. Right. A, as an example, right? So, or so you, I, let, you, let, you let all of the relationships be what they want to be rather than forcing them like, well, I really enjoy hanging out with you and having sex with you, but I don't, I don't want to have to call you every day and say good night. Like if that's what you right. want to do and you just uh -huh. agree, you, you, you come to an agreement with the person you're with about yeah. what the, what the construct is going to be. And then that's what it is. And it doesn't, doesn't need a label, so to speak. Totally. Yeah. And I think that, that one of the misconceptions about it is that I would argue it's actually more about being able to be more committed to more types of relationships and have more nuanced commitments to people rather than kind of what we were talking about of people using it as a way to be like, well, I don't have to commit to anything. I don't have to be responsible to anyone. I'll just do whatever the hell I want all the time. Yeah. Right. That it's kind of, it came from a place of more like, no, we want to be able to build meaningful relationships that might just not look like the ones everyone else thinks are meaningful. Right. Uh, and so, so it is that of defining it together and each relationship defining it together. And for me, right. part of that also means that one of your relationships doesn't get to dictate the terms of another one. Yeah. You know, which kind of goes back to stuff we were talking about with those controlling rules that, that right. partners will do and stuff. Yeah. yeah. So, so along those lines, I know you said you don't date as much now as you used mm -hmm. to, but like, what does your relationship dynamic look like at the moment? If you don't mind sharing yeah. that piece. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so Dedeker, who you'll be interviewing later today, uh, she and I uh, have been together now for like six years, um, and we're you know we're still together, and we both have other partners. Uh, right now, I have one other long term partner, uh, and we'll occasionally go on you know other dates or maybe have you know like I have some friends who I will occasionally be sexual with or play partners or something. Uh, I also travel a lot. So part of that is kind of out of necessity of just sort of like, well, I'm not always going to yeah. be around. I'm not always yeah. going to be in the same time zone, whatever it is. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of what, what mine looks like right now is, is Very these cool. two longer term relationships and others. Well, I guess arguably some of the others are even longer term, but you know, are kind of more of these, uh, more casual relationships. Which yeah. Again, in relationship anarchy, it gets harder yeah. to just like label yeah. everything. So clearly, right? But... Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, for sure. Yeah. Well, I'm, I was curious because you said you travel a lot, and we know you've spent some significant amounts of time in Japan. Yeah. And can you talk a little bit about like what it is like exploring non-monogamy in a culture that isn't your own? Yeah. Totally. Uh, so this is something that I would say Dedeker could probably speak to more than I could because she's spent more chunks of time in various countries. And so she's kind of, she's gotten a little bit of a broader sense of what it's sure. like dating in different cultures. And for myself, uh, it's pretty much only been Japan. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, then and, how is it in Japan, I guess, is maybe a better question. Yeah. So, gosh, it's. It's, it's been interesting because there's sort of like two things developing, maybe three things all at once. One is that polyamory in Japan is a relatively new thing compared to us in the U.S. Uh, just sort of like a, a movement or any kind of community of Japanese people doing it is a newer thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and that there's, there's a, a group in Tokyo uh, and they occasionally will do, I think, every other month they'll do a meetup in some other city in Japan. And then every other month it's in Tokyo, but it is very much like based centered primarily just in Tokyo, maybe a little bit in Osaka, which are kind of the two big, the only mm -hmm. really the only two big metropolitan areas in Japan. Uh, and so there's that. It's also just a, a fairly small community. Um, and then there's sort of a separate community of English speaking polyamorous people in Japan. Yeah. And that, that in itself is, you know, the language thing. And there's people who are in both of those communities, but for the most part, they're separate from each other, largely based on language. But then I think also kind of the cultural background that comes along with 
being brought up in that language. Yeah. yeah. Um, so things I've noticed is, first of all, in Japan, um, I've never had anyone outright be mean to me because of being polyamorous, whereas that's very much a thing that happens in the U.S. Um, mm -hmm. That it, that's just culturally not a thing that's done here. Um, right. Yeah. Being mean in general is not is, really. Yeah. A... <laughs> right. Not, at, not really at least a at least. The, thing. Yeah. It's yeah. not a Japanese thing to do, especially the kind of aggressive upfront in your face kind of mean. Yeah. Now, my impression of that at first was sort of maybe there maybe Japan is more ripe for this. Maybe there's there could be more acceptance here. Maybe it has to do with not having as much of this sort of Judeo-Christian moralism as part of their culture. But over the few years of getting better at Japanese and also talking with more people and kind of starting to understand a little more nuance, I've gotten the impress impression from people that, no, it's actually like just as hard for people to try to be polyamorous here, maybe in a slightly different way, but there is still that similar sense of, you know, our parents or older community members being like, you're ruining the fabric of society by doing this, which I think is something that polyamorous people in the U.S. get as well. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I think also like, uh, like in a lot of countries in Europe, Japan has more of a culture of um, people are married and they have mistresses or ma mistresses. I, I don't know. What's the male equivalent of a mistress? Do you know? Uh, I, I know there's yeah. a word for it. I don't know. We can go with manstress if you want. <laughs> Uh, uh, we're gonna have to google that one, google that one. <laughs> yeah we'll have to look that up um but there's kind of a culture you know like like has been around for a long time in france for example of you're married you have other partners and you just don't talk about it and that's fine in japan there's kind of a similar thing about being gay it's like you can be gay if you want we're actually fine with it as long as you still get married and have kids right. to to a woman you know as long, <laughs> or as long as you you know get heterosexually married and put on the presentation of doing the normal right. stuff. Yeah, yeah, go have sex with guys, whatever. We don't care. You know, go have sex with other women, fine. Like so it's a little different. There's some different nuance right, to it. Right. Yeah. And I'm 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 also exaggerating that maybe a little bit, but uh <laughs> but but there is a difference, you know. Yeah. Um also just in general in Japan, it's like in some ways with same sex relationships, for example, uh you still can't get married. You, you know, gay people can't get married in Japan. Uh, and there's some other actually kind of troubling laws still on the books that, that people are trying to work to change, discriminating against homosexual people and like you can be fired for it and stuff like that. So in some ways, it's like you look at Japan and you go, geez, you guys are really behind the times when it comes to this. And yet so many people I've talked to are like, yeah, I have a trans friend or I have, you know, a... Uh, uh, you know, gay friends who are very open and public about it or gay celebrities or whatever who will walk home from the club at two in the morning down dark alleyways and never be worried for their safety. Yeah. yeah. And that to me was just kind of a mind blowing like, oh, shit, you're right. Like, which which would I choose if I had to choose that? Like, would I rather have more legal rights, but potentially get mugged and, and beat up or maybe even killed for this thing? Or would I maybe rather not have those, but be safe? And I think, you know, there's there's downsides to either. And I think it could be easy to think the grass is greener from either side. But right. it yeah. is it is interesting to see that difference. And yeah, I guess I I found that actually on this trip in Japan, I've seen a lot more signage and posters and things for gender equality uh, specifically. Oh, good. Um, and that the terminology on the posters is moving from, uh, you know, male female equality to gender in general equality. So that I do think, you know, like like the rest of the world, there is kind of a growing awareness of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah. So and then in terms of dating here, I mean, dating in Japan is just in general is just so different. It's a lot less. Um, polyamory tends to be based a lot around very direct communication. And in Japanese dating, communication tends to be, in Japan in general, communication tends to be more indirect. Um, and so that sometimes can be difficult. And I've heard that from, you know, Japanese polyamorous people where they're sort of like, like the response that they'll get might be something like, yeah, 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 cool. Can't you just like shut up and keep it secret like everyone else does? 
Like, we, yeah, we all we all know we do this, but like, can we not talk about it? Because that's embarrassing. Right. Uh, so there's, you know, kind of different maybe obstacles. Yeah. Does, does yeah. that get does that mentality get difficult to then navigate like the safety aspect and the like the health aspect and talking about testing and STIs if they don't want to talk about stuff? Yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. It's something that also I think access to STI testing is not as easy to get here as it is in a lot of the U.S. I know in the U.S. it's harder in some places than others. Yeah. Um, but in general, that is that is there's not there's not. There are, I guess, probably in Tokyo, but I think most people are not aware of their existence. But yeah. so most people it's like I got to go to my doctor and I got to tell them that I want this test and depending on the doctor, maybe even convince them why I should get this test. Uh, you know, and that, that happens in the U S too. I've had to convince doctors to give me certain STI tests. Cause yeah. I'm like, no, I would, I would like to know this. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. So yeah, that, that is challenging. Um, I do feel like, I feel like though I am seeing more of a move to, to kind of normalize practicing safe sex and, um, and getting tested and kind of being more aware of that. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, a Japanese movie that I just watched the other day that came out recently on Japanese Netflix. Unfortunately, <laughs> it's not available in the U.S. Um, <laughs> about um, a, a college student who becomes a yeah, essentially a male prostitute or an escort or whatever you'd want to call it. Um, and in that movie, he uses condoms with everyone and like you visually see him do that like they make a thing out of that in all of the scenes and he goes and gets his sti test results at one point so like the fact that that's even right in there at all i feel like is indicative of that changing a little bit yeah for sure, for sure. Um, but it's but it's still it's always it's always a challenge to get people to do something that they feel uncomfortable even talking about much yeah less. and i and i realize as Being i asked, yeah and I, and I realized as i asked that question that i made it sound like it's it's such a cakewalk in the U.S., but that that's right. not a, that's yeah. not always true. So it's not no. always true. Yeah. No. <laughs> so that was not to be uh, Americentric, <laughs> high yeah. on our horse. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think it also depending what community you're in, that can oh, really yeah. vary. You know, it's just same as in the U.S. Like amongst the people who tend to be my community in the U.S., like that's kind of a obviously, yeah. yeah. Like, why would anyone even question that? If, yeah. if someone ever doubted that, I'd be like, whoa, what? let's have a serious talk about this. If anyone right. questioned, like, why would you ask about my STI health? Right. right. Uh, and I think that in other communities in the U.S., that would be a weird thing for someone to ask, that they would be offended by that. Or, you know, like I think it's easy for me to take for granted that that's normal. And I think within communities here, too, there's probably a similar thing where, you know, definitely within more of like the queer community here, I'd say there's more awareness of that and more kind of activism mm -hmm. for communicating more directly about sex and being more proactive about health when it comes to sex than there would be maybe within kind of the mainstream. Yeah. You know, for sure. Right. Um, changing the subject just slightly. I was curious, yeah. like how, how have you ha navigated, I guess, opening up to family and friends about, about navigating polyamory and that change in yeah. your relationship style over, over the years. Yeah. So when Emily and I opened up our relationship, like again, before it was polyamory, when it was just an open relationship, it was really important to her that kind of in order for that to feel real, that we needed to tell our families that for her, that that was an important thing. And so I think unlike a, a lot of people I know who've opened up their relationships who kind of wait a while to come out, maybe wait a very long time or maybe never do to their families specifically. Mm -hmm. um, that for us, that was like right away before we even knew what the heck we were doing, uh, which looking back, I think both of us have admitted that was not ideal um, <laughs> <laughs> because, because as a lot of people who, who have come out have found, like you get pushback, you get, mm -hmm doubt and questions and people worrying about you and things like that. And if you haven't been doing it long enough to be able to confidently say like, no, actually I am happy or no, actually I do really believe in this or no, actually, you know, we are still together and this is good that you, you kind of don't have, you don't have as much 
conviction for yourself or even just kind of anecdotal evidence to mm-hmm. back up anything. Right. You probably have less non-monogamous friends at that point to even point to and be like, like, mom, calm down. I know people who've been married 20 years and are yeah. polyamorous. You know, like you don't have that yet. Or you have like less ammunition I to didn't. like defend yourself with, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, but I would say that that overall my experience was fairly positive. Um uh, actually, it was funny as my my brother was the one who, when I told him about it, he was like, oh, cool. Uh, my girlfriend in college in, in her sociology course read this book, Sex at Dawn. You should check that out. Uh, and so <laughs> he was actually the one who directed me to read Sex at Dawn first. Like, that's actually where I got huh. that recommendation from, even though he is monogamous and, and uh, has no interest in polyamory, that right. he was still like, was open-minded enough to be like, oh yeah, I, I know some stuff about that. You should check out this book. That's cool. Yeah, that's um, awesome. Yeah, and uh, and generally my parents were, we have gone through different phases over the years, but generally, you know, accepting of it and just being like, I just want you to be safe and be happy and all of that. Um, but then later on, kind of more the nuance of of like at family gatherings, for example, I was at my mom's wedding, actually. My mom just got remarried recently and I was at her wedding and I was there with Dedeker and my brother was there with his wife who they had just gotten married the year before. And, you know, we're doing all the different configurations of people for pictures. And then at one point we were doing like, oh, let's do a picture with, you know, my mom and and her husband and his kids and her kids, you know, all together. And then it was like, oh, my brother's wife. It's like, oh, come on, you're family too. But Dedeker didn't get that same invitation, even though Dedeker and I have been together longer than my brother and his wife have known each other. So there's that kind of like, mm, well, yeah. all right. And it kind of made me realize, like, I don't think any malicious intent was there at all. I don't think that was any intentional effort to exclude Dedeker, but it's just that, that mindset of like, oh, well they're married. So that's real. And they're not. So it's not. Yeah. Uh, And you're not, you're not committed enough. So we don't want her in this picture. Right. Cause, cause I mean, yeah, you've been together six years, but we don't know if it'll work out because you're not married where you two have only been together five years, but you're married now. So, you know, there's that kind of these assumptions we make about things. Yeah. Um, Oh man. And so it did prompt Dedeker and I'd have a conversation and kind of talk about how much does that matter to us? Is that a conversation that I should have with my mom to say, hey, you know, what could we do to sort of show you that this relationship is just as serious as that? Uh, right. You know, we're, we're not going to get married because just personally, that's not something either of us wants to do in our lives. Mm-hmm. But is there is there something, is it just as simple as telling you, Hey, this is serious or would it, would it be helpful for you family, you know, talking not just to my mom, but to other family members, like, would it, would it help you if we did some kind of ceremony as sort of a public way of showing this is a serious relationship? I don't don't know. Right. Uh, But just, it kind of prompted us to realize like, Oh, huh. We're still, there's still that, that's still a conversation that maybe needs to be had. Yeah. Yeah. That's tough. Yeah. That's super tough. Yeah. And yeah, and you don't have the right answer, right? You have to, you and Dedeker have to decide what do you want for you and how to approach that with your family. And, you know, and that's, what's worth, what's, and what's worth, worth doing it. the effort to, yes. yeah. 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 Definitely. yeah. Yeah. I feel like it took me several years for her mom to take me even a little bit seriously, uh, partly because, you know, Dedeker was in a longer term relationship before she met me. That, you know, she's no longer with him, but even years after they had broken up, in her mom's mind, he was still the real boyfriend and I was kind of the side one. Yeah. You know, and it <laughs> took quite a while for that to change, just sort of proving it over time, I guess. Yeah, uh, yeah for sure. So, and I mean, it's, so it's easy to get mad, right, like at families and stuff for doing things like that. But you also have to look mm-hmm. at it saying, well it's also been ingrained in our society to look at it like that for so long. So, yeah. well, yeah. they should be open, more open-minded and more accepting at the same time. They're probably working over, you know, working through their own um, social uh, influence over the years as well. It's, yeah. And it's, it's, it's hard. <laughs> yeah. It, and it's one of those things where 
I think we're, our, our society is maybe not the best at doing this, but I think it is a very important skill of realizing that both of those things can be true at the same time. Exactly. And it's like, for the example, you know, when you, you know, with, when it comes to sexual harassment stuff and you like look at people back in the 60s and it's like, okay, maybe they didn't know any better. So that does inform their actions and, and you know, maybe can inform how we think about that. But at the same time, it also doesn't make it okay. Right, right. And it's like that. It's like you can kind of there. You can make space for both of like exactly. you. Mm-hmm. Your experience can be just as hurt. Like the fact that they don't know any better doesn't mean that hurts any less. Yeah. yeah. Or that or that your feelings are any less valid. And at the same time, you can also kind of understand where they're coming from. And that's. Right. I think holding that duality in our minds and hearts at once is something that fundamentalism has really driven us away from being able to do. And I think it's something that humans used to do a lot more. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. when we had more of a sense of fable and storytelling and religion, not having to be about facts, but more about these are important stories, whether they're true or not. Yeah. Uh, and that that's something that, that, you know, I guess to get sort of nerdy about it, that, sort of the the enlightenment and this move toward being able to prove things scientifically kind of caused this reaction amongst religions to be like no we're an absolute truth too and before that it's like well whatever truth truth is what we make it you know kind of didn't didn't matter in the same way right and that sort of as a reaction it led everyone to kind of polarize more and and fundamentalism was sort of born out of that which is really only a few hundred years ago um yeah but i think that's still very ingrained in us of this everything's got to be black and white someone's got to be all bad or all good or this event had to be all bad or all good or you know that kind of thing for yeah. sure yeah yeah well i mean we, want, we want... I, I was like i we could talk to you all night but <laughs> yeah. we should we probably should... um start wrapping it up so right. well and in, in yeah and with that in mind is there any any final things that you wanted to share that we didn't touch on that you that you like to to get out there in the world when you when you have an audience besides your own? <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, I I love talking about all this stuff, so it's hard to hard to pick and choose. But I I guess the one sort of message that I always want to get across to people is that there isn't there's not one right way to do relationships. But the one way that I think is wrong to do relationships is when you never examine them, when you never examine your beliefs about it. And so that's that's my only thing is just like be courageous enough to to question and examine what's going on and, and allow things to change. That that's kind of been, I think, the through line with both multi-amory and in my own life and in people I know who are are able to adapt and people who I look at and go, wow, like you are someone who's inspiring in the way that you carry yourself in the world and the things that you do and the way that you are, the way that you show up in your relationships mm-hmm. is this willingness to examine and and question and never decide, okay, I got my black and white answer and I'm going to stick with this. Yeah. Uh, that that's, that's, I just think, I think that's the biggest thing and it'll might take you on a different journey and maybe end up at the same place through different routes but just Mm -hmm. that willingness to examine is is key yeah and thank you for sharing that i think it's super important and uh we agree with that as well um how about where people can find multi-amory and how they could contact you if you're okay sharing that too yeah totally uh finding multi-amory probably the easiest way is to just google multi-amory uh, our, you know, our podcast, you can find wherever you get podcasts, mm-hmm. just searching for multi Amory and for our website, it's multi Amory.com and on all the social media or multi Amory yep. mm-hmm. or some variation on multi Amory podcast or multi or, you know, whatever, whatever it is. <laughs> uh, and, um, for me personally, probably the best way to get in touch is, uh, is probably just email, which is jace at multi Amory.com. Uh, and that's J-A-S-E. Yep. People misspell that one a lot. Well, we'll, uh, we'll, put, yeah. we'll put links for everything in the show notes cool. so people will have no no excuses. Not to, <laughs> not to come you. listen to that. <laughs> yeah, <find> yeah. <laughs> so. totally. And really, just if you go to Multiamory, we've all got our emails up yes. on there. And, and yep. that's that's probably the, the easiest central source to find any of the links to other things is just yeah. Multiamory.com. Cool. Right Perfect. 
Well, thank you so much for your time. And we appreciate it so much that you're willing to come on and share your story. I know your story's out there on your show. So it was fun to fun to have you come on and uh, share recap it. recap it yeah. condense it down into an hour <laughs> right yeah yeah it was great talking with you too i'm glad we finally got to connect like this yeah, yeah. absolutely well thanks again and have a wonderful morning and and then afternoon <laughs> yeah thanks have a good night have a fun interview with dedeker i will do our best <laughs> and we're back what'd you think it was amazing as always what do you think i agree i'm learning to suck less at communication <laughs> i know we're, I think we're always think, all learning that. Yeah, I was going to say, I think we're constantly learning that because every day you can probably improve something in your communication. Not you, but I've yeah. other people in this relationship uh-huh. for sure. Both of us. <laughs> Thanks, Jace, for coming on the show and sharing your amazing story. And everyone, go check out the Multi Emory podcast. They have a lot of an amazing stuff over there. Yeah, they have over 200 episodes, close to 250, I think. Maybe even 250 exactly on this day. I don't remember. It's like 248, 249. Something like that, yeah. Depending on when you listen to this. <laughs> All right. What's next week? Are we take, I think we should take the week off next yeah, week. Yeah, maybe we should. Who cares about episode 100, right? You're what? so funny. <laughs> it's not like I've been excited about it or anything. What do we have for episode 100? We have a dynamic unlike any we've ever had on the show. Yes. In 99 episodes, this one is unique. Well, everyone is unique, but, yeah, but this, this one is, is like I think it takes the cake. Like the cake has been taken. I know. So we're not even gonna tell you any more than that. You're gonna have to wait and come back next Wednesday for episode 100, and your minds will be blown. And then the week after that, it will be another palindrome episode 101. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll see everybody in a week for 100. Okay, bye everyone. Thanks for listening.